Uh, hi guys, uh, uh, we are welcoming uh, today Professor Justin Corey from uh, Department of Physics and Astronomy, University of Pennsylvania at Philadelphia, USA. At our QSTM forum, this is the 81st uh, number 81 talk in the series. And we are very happy to have Professor Justin in our forum. And thank you, Justin, for agreeing to give this talk. And I'm very hopeful that we will learn a lot of things from you regarding string landscape. And he's going to speak about a very interesting topic, uh, which is dynamical criticality on the string landscape, which is based on his series of works, which he's already done, and uh, some work which uh, will appear soon. Um, so, um, Justin, you can start. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Sayantan, for the nice invitation. Uh, so, yeah, the work I'll describe uh, today is, uh, well, something I've been thinking about for more than three years now. Um, it's led to the papers shown, and uh, there's a number of things that are uh, in that we're trying to finish at the moment. So let me uh, begin maybe by stating um, some of the questions that have really been guiding my research uh, in the last few years. And the two questions that are most important, I think, in my mind are, why is the universe so simple and minimal? Um, in particle physics, uh, of course, the discovery of the Higgs was a monumental triumph for the standard model. But beyond the Higgs, there seems to be no hint of new physics coming from the LHC, no new particles. Most importantly, if you do take the standard model Higgs with 125 GeV and you extrapolate the standard model up to high energy, one finds that in fact, there is no breakdown of perturbativity all the way to the Planck scale. So there is no, uh, how should I say, need apparently from this point of view for new physics. On the gravitational side, meanwhile, in the last 10 years, you know, GR has really come out triumphant. Uh, we've now tested gravity with exquisite precision, both in the laboratory as well now in the strong field regime of black holes. And meanwhile, the cosmological data is converging uh, on dark energy being well described by a cosmological constant. So surprises may be lurking. Uh, we may always be surprised uh, in the coming years, but at the moment, it seems that this simple and economical model of the universe seems to be the correct picture. Relatedly, uh, or a consequence of yeah, this-, of this I, have, I have a question from your previous slides. Sure. <laughs> Yeah, my question is regarding uh, the present status of uh, the supersymmetry. So what is the exact status in LHC like regarding uh, ruling out the parameter space or something like what some something new or beyond the standard model physics? Do you know anything about Well, at the moment, you know, uh, you know, within some class of models, let's say the MSSM, one can put a, uh, you know, a, a lower bound on the mass of supersymmetric partners, so of the order of a few TeV. Mm -hmm. um, of course, with the next run of the LHC, things will improve somewhat. Um, but at least talking to my experimental colleagues here at Penn, I think it's clear that if there is supersymmetry um, in the data, it's coming in the form of more subtle signals than uh, than the simplest models would indicate. So yeah, we could be surprised and there maybe there is something in the data, but I will argue that in fact, in my opinion, this seems to be unlikely. Uh, one is because of this, it seems that the standard model extrapolated doesn't indicate by itself the need for any new physics. Of course, this leaves open the reason for the uh, weak hierarchy problem or the, the, the answer uh, the explanation for the, the weak hierarchy problem. But at least from a purely data point of view, I don't see a pressing need for new physics. Okay. 
Thank you. And this actually, your question ties into my next point, which is that indeed one, one goes through this exercise of extrapolating the standard model, one discovers a remarkable, uh, a remarkable feature, which is that our vacuum is metastable. The electroweak vacuum is metastable. Uh, this is pictured here. So if you take the renormalization group equations and you extrapolate the Higgs potential up to high field values, various possibility could be contemplated as shown in the left plot, right? The potential may remain stable. It may become unstable, okay? Which would indicate the need for new particles for consistency. Or one can find ourselves in a metastable regime where the vacuum is long lived, but has a finite decay probability. And on the right-hand plot, this is the phase space diagram of the standard model. And you see the ellipses, this tiny ellipses, puts us within this metastability sliver, okay? So there is really here a, a numerical conspiracy. Um, and when people worked out the lifetime of the standard model given measured parameters, the lifetime of course turns out to be stupendously long of order 10 to the 500 years with large error bars, that being said. So this is reassuringly long, okay? We don't have to be uh, stressed about this. Uh, but importantly, from my point of view, this really requires a delicate numerical conspiracy between exponentially large numbers and exponentially small numbers. And it's shown here in this formula. You see the two factors here, the space-time uh, volume of the universe, uh, which is the prefactor, uh, times this exponential, which involves the inverse of the quartic coupling at a very high energy scale. So it's exponentially sensitive to this quartic coupling, in particular, if the quartic coupling were, you know, more negative by, you know, a factor of a few, the lifetime would become dramatically uh, shorter, okay? So this conspiracy, which by the way, involves the, the volume of the observable universe, in other words, the cosmological constant implicitly, and electroweak uh, physics through the running of the quartic coupling. But in my mind, this, accident this cannot be an accident um yes yeah isn't it very fine-tuned like the oh, you can understand what i ex exactly want to point so like uh, then how good is this kind of uh, theories like we are talking about i know that th this problem is there for a long time there is no other way but uh, do you think so something can be done with this fine tuning problem or something like that? Uh, um, well, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure uh, about whether to think about it quite in this way. I would say that, um, yeah, first thing to say is that, of course, this conclusion uh, depends very much so on whether there is new physics below the, between the weak scale and the instability scale, which is around 10 to the 10 GeV. If there are new particles that would show up, then this calculation is, is, is invalid. That being said, I think this, um, this numerical conspiracy, if you wish, uh, is quite remarkable. And uh, I would say that, you know, the moment you say that we think there is new physics, let's say at the weak scale or so, it's very unlikely that this numerical conspiracy would survive, which, which, which would mean then that it was just an accident of this extrapolation of the standard model. It was purely a fluke. I don't think that is the case. Uh, I think nature is giving us in fact a profound hint you know, this in conjunction with the fact that the standard model can be extrapolated to me is, uh, is a sign that one has to understand why the universe uh, is so close to this instability. At least that's the viewpoint that I will take in this talk. Yeah, I have one more question. So this, uh, this vacuum stability uh, here projected uh, in the light of the well-known standard model, but like if there are modification in the standard model, then also the universe is metastable or there might be something else? That's a great question. That's a great question. So this is something I'll mention towards the end, but I can tell you immediately. Of course, we don't 
I mean, there are many good theoretical reasons to think that there's something more than the standard model. For example, right hand in neutrinos is, uh, is well motivated. Um, also, of course, we need a dark matter candidate. There are two parts to, the, to this question. Um, one is that if you have new particles, let's say right handed neutrinos, but they would only show up at very high energy scale, well above the scale of 10 to the 10 GeV. 10 to the 10 GeV is the scale where precisely the potential crosses zero, okay? So if you have things coming well above that scale, this will not affect the metastability of the vacuum, okay? So that's number one. Number two is with regards to say dark matter, this uh, metastability analysis doesn't preclude the existence of very weakly coupled particles. Particles that would be very weakly coupled to the Higgs, uh, for instance, would have no impact on this, would have very little impact on this calculation. So an example of this would be say the axion. Um, if, it's, if the dark matter is an axion, um, actually, I'll consider that case later, then uh, it may leave the vac this, this metastability calculation um, uh, untouched. And that's the point of view that, in fact, I'm going to take, that I want to think of this observable as sacred, ultimately. And, uh, and that gives us a handle on what we can expect new physics to be. But this is way, way later in the talk. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, in fact, uh, indeed, this metastability problem can be thought of as a problem of near criticality. Why are we so close to a phase transition? And it's striking to me that other problems in theoretical physics, other fine tuning problems can be thought of as problems of near criticality. The, uh, for starters, the weak hierarchy problem, one way to think about the weak hierarchy problem is let's say that in a theory, uh, such as string theory, the Higgs mass could take a range of values over the entire natural range, which would be, which would be between minus m Planck squared and plus m Planck squared. In one extreme, uh, where the Higgs mass is positive uh, and, Planck, and Planckian, the electroweak phase would be, you know, very much preserved, as shown on the left. And at the other extreme, if the Higgs mass squared is negative and Planck squared, then electroweak symmetry would be badly broken, giving rise to a Higgs web of order and Planck. So somehow the smallest of the Higgs mass and, and consequently the smallness of the web of the Higgs relative to M Planck can be understood as the standard model being very close to the symmetry breaking point between unbroken electroweak symmetry and broken electroweak symmetry. Analogously, uh, though not quite as precise, but I would say equally uh, intuitive is the cosmological constant problem. Again, if we think of the cosmological constant as ranging from minus M Planck to the fourth to plus M Planck to the fourth, then the corresponding space times uh, would range from a highly curved anti-de-sitter space shown on the right uh, and on the positive end, a highly curved de-sitter space. Minkowski space in some sense represents a quantum critical point between these two extremes. Our universe is of course de-sitter, which seems to be asymptotically de-sitter, but very, with a very small cosmological constant compared to M Planck. So in this sense, we are close to this critical point. We are close to a Minkowski flat space time which delineates, uh, as shown here, two different space times with different asymptotics and different stability properties. So last but not least, I, I have it, yes. In the previous slide. So this uh, anti-decitter, why you are saying this to be like uh, non-linearly unstable? What do we uh, mean by non-linearity here? Yeah, so it's been shown uh, in recent years, actually, the last decade or so. So, of course, you know that if you take linear perturbations in anti de Sitter, they oscillate, okay? So they are stable in this sense. However, when you consider nonlinear perturbations on, on anti de Sitter, people have shown it depends. There's a basin, if you want, of such perturbations which are stable, okay? But others which will 
which will lead to an instability, a growing instability in anti the sitter. This is in contrast with the sitter space, which has been shown numerically, even under nonlinear perturbations, to be stable. Yeah, that's why I have actually asked because the sitter case I know, the anti the sitter, I was just want to make sure what exactly going on. Thank you. Yeah, this has this is a result of the last ten years or so. It's it's generated a lot of interest looking at instabilities of anti the sitter. And, this, uh, by the way, this, um, this story of criticality delineating between st stability and instability regimes, dynamical regimes will come back later. So last but not least, uh, I wanna say also the early universe, the fact that we observe a universe whose primordial perturbations are nearly scale invariant also is indicative uh, of critical phenomena. And not surprisingly, the mechanism traditionally invoked to explain the origin of these perturbations, namely slow rolling inflation itself, of course, can be understood as a phase of approximate conformal invariance. Uh, this is something that I've worked on, many people have worked on, but you can think of slow rolling inflation as a phase of spontaneously broken conformal group in R3. Uh, spontaneously broken to the group of three-dimensional rotations and translations. Okay, so this is just uh, propaganda, but uh, I would say that from my point of view, uh, this near criticality of our universe may be the strongest indirect uh, piece of evidence that we have for the existence of a landscape. It suggests a statistical physics uh, approach and of course, the natural arena for the statistical physics of universes is the landscape of string theory. What I want to argue in this talk, in fact, is that the near criticality of our universe may be tied with non-equilibrium critical dynamics in the landscape. This is what we will see. So just to set the stage a little bit, as you all know, um, the landscape of, of string theory is the vast landscape of metastable states that we call vacua, which are a function of the size and shapes of extra dimensions. Much remains to be understood about the detailed properties of this landscape, in particular, the swampland program, tries to understand how the subtle constraints of quantum gravity may affect constraints on the low energy theories. But what seems unambiguous is the landscape is vast and complex and that physical parameters vary across these different vacua, giving rise to a plethora of low energy quantum field theories. And furthermore, we have a powerful dynamical mechanism, namely eternal inflation to populate these vacua. So powerful indeed that it gives rise uh, to a problem, which is how in such a framework did a vacuum like ours get selected? So in this landscape, of course, there will be a multitude of vacua which are inhabitable, inhospitable, uh, and a few, a minority, a minority, presumably, which are hospitable. And here, by the way, I'm not going to invoke any strong version of the anthropic principle. By hospitable, I just mean very basic, uh, what we think are basic criteria for the emergence of complex life forms or intelligent forms, uh, which would be possibility of chemistry, uh, uh, some reasonable amount of dark matter and primordial perturbations that allow for structures to grow. But I will not actually um, make any more concrete statement than this. Uh, of course, in the context of eternal inflation, uh, there is an embarrassment of riches in some sense that all these vacua are not just populated, but they're populated an infinite number of times as inflation proceeds. So to make predictions, to be able to compare probabilities of different vacua, once one needs to regulate these ratio of infinities and that comes with some cutoff prescription, some regulator. And this is the measure problem. And one thing I want to say is that this is not just some, some you know, theoretical 
annoyance, in my mind, this is crucial to make predictions ultimately in our own universe. So there have been two approaches, and I'm saying this to set the stage, two approaches to the measure problem, sort of two schools of thoughts uh, on how to approach this problem. The first one uh, is called the global measures, in which you pick a global foliation of this multiverse, uh, and you take some cutoff surface at late times, you count bubbles on this cutoff surface, and eventually you let the cutoff surface go to infinity. The, the nice, the virtue of this approach is that it is independent of initial conditions. That is to say, if you make small changes on the initial surface in your initial data and you wait long enough, the final predictions will be insensitive to these initial conditions. But on the other hand, that's a famous and well-known problem. The answers that you get, the predictions that you get depend sensitively on the cho choice of foliation, the choice of your time slicing in this multiverse. Uh, I have a question. So these mm -hmm. uh, vacua, like uh, series of vacua you are telling, all these are causally connected to each other? No, so these vacua that you're, these bubbles in my little diagram, most of them are space-like separated. Okay. Some of them are nested within one another. Some of them collide, uh, but they're zero are in fact space-like separated. Okay. Okay. And uh, that will not going to, uh, so I, I can understand that for each of the vacua, the minima is at different, different height. So uh, that will not going to affect any kind of the initial condition that we choose for inflation. Like, for hey, can you say again? I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't fully understand. No, I, I'm just asking that once you have a field, you actually use that when that crosses the horizon, when the inflation starts for particular uh, values of the number of e-foldings, you just choose some initial condition. Okay, for a particular field, for a single field, I know. Now, if you have now uh, infinite number of fields with uh, different, different heights of vacua, so my question is, like uh, how people can keep track on all these uh, possible, um, uh, like, are they affecting the initial condition at all? Like you said that it is insensitive, but how, how that can be possible? That's why I'm asking. Well, um, yeah. Uh, so if you even, let's say this is this uh, picture that I'm drawing applies even to the simplest inflationary model, let's say M squared phi squared, um, in that, as you know very well, uh, if I start sufficiently high on the potential, inflation will start. And then you have both the classical rolling of that scalar, which locally in space ends inflation. But of course, because of quantum diffusion, other parts of the universe keep on inflating. And so truly in this, in this larger space time, different parts of the universe keep on inflating. Um, and so the number of evil across space will vary depending on where you are. The statement about insensitivity to initial conditions is that if you wait long enough, long enough after this onset of eternal inflation, then the predictions you would make in principle, you know, given a prescription like the one I'm showing here, would be insensitive to how exactly, where precisely the field started out. And that's just because as time goes on, you produce so many evils of inflation that you are highly insensitive to to where you started. Does that answer your question? Yes. Thank you. And of course, as you say, the picture here is more complicated in, in that it's not just one field, but there are a large number and fields that are at play. The one distinction I wanna make, by the way, is that here uh, I am thinking to be precise more about false vacuum inflation where you know, we get trapped in a in metastable states in this landscape, and then we tunnel out of them. Uh, but 
one can easily equally apply the considerations to uh, quantum diffusion and inflation. But I'll be thinking more about false vacuum inflation. Anyways, this was the global perspective. One can also uh, take another approach, which is the so-called local measure. And here the idea is that you follow a single time-like geodesic or perhaps a family of such geodesics. And along each world line, you look at all the vacua that one will experience just following the, this geodesic. The virtue of this approach is clearly it is by construction gauge invariant, you're picking one trajectory uh, and the number of bubbles that you encounter is a gauge invariant quantity, but it does depend on the initial conditions. Clearly, not every observer will have the same sequence of events because every observer, all but a measure zero, will eventually hit an ADS vacuum, which then crunches and that's the end of it. For what it's worth, I'm gonna take seriously this approach of this watcher. So let me show you how I think about it, perhaps more pictorially. So here's a, a watcher uh, in the universe. I call it the watcher to distinguish from, from an observer. Okay, so this is a fictitious uh, witness of what's happening in the universe. So on the right-hand side, this is a space-time diagram. And this, this fiducial watcher is just standing still in this picture. And he starts out, uh, he or she starts out in a particular vacuum shown on the left. And as time goes on, this watcher will experience a sequence of transitions as shown here. And therefore, although the watcher is standing still in space time from the point of view of the landscape, he or she is undergoing a random walk. So this is the first key idea idea that dynamics on the landscape is equivalent to a random walk. And in fact, you can abstract yourself from all the details of the landscape and think of it as a network shown here where the nodes are the different vacua and the links are the allowed transitions, the allowed, to be precise, the allowed Coleman de Lucia instant on transitions connecting these different vacua. So this allows us to piggyback on the vast amount of progress that's been made in the last two decades or so in network science. This is really a culmination or a conjunction, let's say of big data, the access to a lot of data from various different systems um, together with uh, progress in graph theory to understand the properties of such systems. And in fact, in the landscape in eternal inflation, the dynamical uh, process couldn't be any simpler. It is just governed by a linear Markov equation shown here. So here I'm showing you the equation. F sub i, you can think of as the probability at a given time t that the walker, the watcher, is in vacuum i, okay? And this matrix Mij is a transition matrix which involves the rates kappa ij to transition from the jth vacuum to the ith vacuum, okay? So it's a linear Markov equation. It doesn't get any simpler than this. The difficulty of the problem is not in solving this equation, but it's in interpreting the result, okay? So let me first uh, sketch what the standard approach is to this problem. And this is a beautiful, uh, beautiful set of work that was initiated by uh, Alex Vilenkin and John Magariga in which you, given this Markov process, you just wait asymptotically till you reach an approximate equilibrium distribution for this Markov process. So this probability F sub i asymptotes to the following. The leading term all sits in terminal vacua. These are either ADS or Minkowski vacua, out of which you do not tunnel to another dissiter. And since we, uh, but the volume instead is, is determined by the subleading term, which is the, the, the least decaying, um, the most slowly decaying, um, decaying mode. And that one can show intuitively this subleading eigenvector is dominated by the most stable the sitter vacuum across the entire landscape. So I've shown it here as a red dot, okay? So you just take the entire landscape and you ask, what is the vacuum which has the longest lifetime? 
Of course, unless we are extremely lucky, this dominant vacuum will not be hospitable. Okay, we shouldn't be living there. And hence, the set of hospitable vacua that are favored by this approach, these hospitable vacua must be, must, must be populated by up tunneling from this dominant vacuum. And then you up tunnel, and then you do some downward transitions to populate the uh, hospitable vacua. And the hope is that among all the hospitable vacua, our vacuum thus selected should be typical or generic. This is known as the principle of mediocrity. Now, I wanna stress that while there's nothing logically wrong with this picture, it's logically consistent. I wanna stress that these fluctuations, these upward fluctuations are tremendously rare, okay? The time scale for which, on which they occur is given by the recurrence time for the corresponding vacuum, okay? So it scales, the time scale scales as exponential of the dissiter entropy of such a vacuum. And the probability is correspondingly exponentially suppressed. It's doubly exponentially suppressed, I should stress. So if you were to think of the entropy that you would uh, plot as a watcher, okay, the entropy would be nearly maximized and when you reach this vacuum, this dominant vacuum, and then you're looking for a tremendously large downward fluctuation in entropy to produce the hospitable vacua in this way. By the way, just to put this in some perspective, let's say that a vacuum with our cosmological constant were the dominant vacuum. This upward tunneling corresponds to the entire observable universe up tunneling to very high energy spontaneously. Okay, so this is just to get a sense of how rare these upward fluctuations are. And indeed, a, this raises the specter of other rare and unwanted fluctuations, namely Boltzmann brains. Okay, so one has to be in some sense mindful, uh, no pun intended, you have to be mindful of the fact that uh, these are so rare that at late times, the multiverse may be vastly dominated by these fluke uh, brains, okay? And this is something, of course, that people have considered. Now, relatedly to this problem is that this approach to the quasi-stationary distribution takes an exponentially long time. If you want, the landscape globally is highly rugged and therefore has a doubly exponentially long mixing time. Relatedly, people have shown, have argued that to find a vacuum within some range of vacuum energy, some small hospitable range, corresponds to an NP hard problem, okay? Um, there, again, there's nothing wrong with this, but one just has to appreciate the difficulty of this search algorithm, the complexity of this search algorithm, I should say. And another thing I should stress is that this is really hardly unique to string theory. Uh, many problems in the real world, including for instance, famously the protein folding problem is also NP complete and protein uh, folding has a very complex energy landscape, highly multidimensional and so forth. Let me pause here to see if there are any questions. No, you proceed. So in this talk, instead, I'm gonna propose that we focus not on this late time quasi equilibrium situation, but instead that we consider the approach to equilibrium. In other words, I wanna conjecture, I wanna propose that we may be living a, at relatively early times in the multiverse, much earlier than this exponentially long, doubly exponentially long relaxation time. And this really changes your mindset as to how you should approach the multiverse in this case. Instead of asking what hospitable vacua occur most frequently according to some late time, asymptotically late time equilibrium distribution, instead the proper question to ask is what hospitable vacua have the right properties to be populated early on. And this is a perspective that as far as I know was first put forward by these authors. So in other words, again, if you think about the entropy uh, experienced, uh, observed by a single watcher, 
Here, the universes we're thinking about are those that are produced or accessed as the entropy increases initially. And we are generating thus, not Boltzmann universes, but just normal uh, entropy increasing universes. And as I'm gonna argue, this actually uh, suggests a powerful selection mechanism, uh, which is similar to natural selection in some sense, analogous, and which favors the vacua that are tuned at criticality. Now, one technical challenge uh, is that when you work at early times before the mixing time, most vacua, the majority of hospitable vacua, have only been at best accessed once or perhaps not at all, okay? So looking for stationary uh, distributions is not the right uh, approach. We must find statistics that are appropriate for this situation. And this is well known in the literature, the relevant statistics are first passage statistics. So let me now turn to explain more concretely the framework that we will have in mind. Let us think about a finite region of the landscape. So a neighborhood of the landscape, which is comprised of a large number of vacua. Now for concreteness, I'm gonna assume that all, all these vacua are the sitter vacua. Of course, this is somewhat unrealistic. We also expect many ADS vacua, but just to simplify our discussion, let us focus on the sitter vacua. And I'm gonna treat this region as a closed system for simplicity. As we've said, uh, the dynamics of a watcher on this uh, landscape region uh, satisfies a linear Markov equation, a master equation of the following form involving transition rates between these vacua. Now, the key conceptual step is to think that in the vastness of the landscape, there will be or could be many copies of so, our region, our initial uh, region. In, in yes. the past slide that you have pointed this uh, transition equation or like some master equation, is it like similar like yes. I'm asking for curiosity? Because it seems like it, it is like a Liouville equation. Is it like that? It's a quantum. It is a what, excuse me? Liouville equation, the quantum Liouville equation. Yeah, 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 precisely. So this equation, um, in fact, is a discretized version of a Fokker Planck equation. You can think of it this way. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay, that's so that's in great. fact, yeah. 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 yeah, so in some, uh, yeah, for example, so if in the limit where these vacua could be treated, if I were to imagine in coarse graining over this, over these vacua, to think, you know, after suitable coarse graining, it would look like a smooth surface. Um, indeed, you could translate these, uh, these kappa ij's effectively into some Laplacian, okay, some diffusion and noise terms uh, in this equation. Yeah, so it is very much like a Fokker Planck equation. Okay. It's the discretized version of it, if you want. Okay. Yeah, so um, coming back to this point, uh, we want to think of it as an ensemble. We want to think that the landscape realizes an ensemble of such regions in the vastness of the landscape. And we want to think of these regions each as having roughly on average the same number of vacua, but with slight difference in topology and in transition rates between these vacua. Now, by the way, this this ensemble need not exist per se, but it's a correct, it's a useful way to frame the optimization problem in our mind. And correspondingly, in the space time, this would correspond to a ensemble of watchers, each of which is exploring his or her region uh, in the landscape. So you think of these as animals, as foragers who are looking for scarce resources. Their scarce resources are the hospitable vacua in each of these regions. And the foraging strategy of these animals correspond is fixed by the topology of the region and the transition rates. At least this is how I like to think about it. Now, more concretely, the transition rates we have in mind are Kolmendelucia transitions. And the Kolmendelucia transition rate, as was shown a long time ago, 
is of the following form. It's the ratio of an adjacency matrix, which includes the fluctuation determinant m to the fourth and e to the minus Euclidean action for the instant on. Importantly, this adjacency matrix is symmetric in I and J as shown by Lee and Weinberg in the 80s. Okay, so from that point of view, this AIJ numerator is symmetric in going from I to J or J to I. The asymmetry of the transition rates all come from the denominator, which is the weight factor. And the weight factor is the weight of the initial vacuum, which is an exponential, crucially an exponential in the De Sitter entropy of such a vacuum. So the lower energy vacua, which therefore have high De Sitter entropy, are exponentially weighted. Finally, there's a choice of lapse function, N, which appears in the weight. Let's not get too distracted with this. It is simply a, a, a transition between, it encodes the time transition between the proper time along the watcher and whatever clock the watcher chooses to use. Let's not get distracted by this. What I really wanna stress is that given the symmetry of the adjacency matrix, the ratio of going one way versus the reverse process, so I to J versus J to I, as shown in this little uh, sketch, ends up being exponentially suppressed by the difference in entropy. In other words, up tunneling from a vacuum relative to down tunneling is exponentially suppressed, doubly exponentially suppressed in general. This is very analogous to in the usual thermal landscape to simply the usual Gibbs or Boltzmann suppression for in detailed balance. Hmm? Okay, let's move on. Let us consider uh, indeed the dynamics in our region given by this uh, equation as we just discussed with Sayan Tan and we, we can for uh, we can, for fun, consider in our closed system the local equilibrium distribution. Okay, let's think about this. Now, uh, what you can show is that this Mij matrix uh, satisfies basically uh, the requirements of Ferron Frobenius' theorem. Uh, for instance, the sum of the columns of Mij is zero. Okay. Um, and you can, it's also in some way positive definite, et cetera. So ultimately you can argue that the eigenvalues of Mij are, are such that there is one unique uh, vanishing eigenvalue, the zero mode, and a set of non-vanishing eigenvalues, which correspond to transients. Okay, the zero mode of course is gonna be the equilibrium eigen mode it sets the equilibrium distribution, this zero mode, and you can show analytically that it is set uniquely by the weights of the vacua, okay? At late times, you're not sensitive to the particular transition rates, only to the weights. And as you see here, uh, it favors vacua with the largest weight, that is to say the lowest energy vacua in the region, and it does so exponentially. But of course, we're not interested. Yes. Yeah, so yes, you you talk about the equilibrium distribution, but what happens when the system is not in equilibrium and very sensitive to the initial condition, something like that. exactly that's where I'm going next. Yes, that's right. That was just to set the stage. But we are in fact, in our case, we are not interested in the equilibrium. Uh, we're interested indeed in the approach to equilibrium. So this is yeah. what I'll discuss next. Yeah, thank you for your question. That connection, I just want to point that uh, is there is a connection with the random matrix theory, like the random matrices, the construction properties of the random matrices that will going to any uh, play any role? Ah, thank you. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Right. So later on uh, in the talk, I will discuss. Um, I will discuss indeed approaches of random landscape theory, okay, which, uh, which indeed ties into random matrices. Um, maybe we postpone that a little bit. Uh, I will, in fact, the approach 
approach that we will take, or one approach that we will take is to model the landscape as a random graph and see uh, and see what lessons we can draw from that. Yeah, okay. but indeed, as you correctly point out, there's been a lot of work thinking about uh, about landscapes through random uh, processes. Could be Gaussian random landscapes or uh, as I'm going to argue, random graphs. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. sure. That's right. In fact, I, I, I could go on and on about this question, but maybe <laughs> I should just move on. Uh, this, is, this is a very nice question. OK. Uh, so indeed, as you correctly pointed out, Sayantan, uh, what we're really interested in is the approach to equilibrium, and in particular, how rapidly is equilibrium reached? Now, a popular measure of approach to equilibrium is the mean first passage time which is defined as follows. You pick some initial node, which you call I, and some destination node that I'm gonna call L, and you look for the average time taken to follow all the different paths that connect I to L on this, uh, on this graph. That mean first passage time is what I call T I goes to L. And it's furthermore convenient as shown by Kemeny that you can consider the average of this mean first passage time by averaging, as shown here, averaging over the destinations, J, where you weigh by the stationary distribution, okay? Meaning you have to weigh your destinations in some way. And it turns out that it's very convenient to weigh according to the stationary distribution, which by the way, is what we care about in some sense, because this is weighing the distribution to finding essentially the lowest energy vacuum in the region, okay? Um, and famously, as Kemeny showed or argued, this quantity, Kemeny's constant, is independent of where you start on the graph, somehow counterintuitively. Uh, in fact, there was a prize in mathematics in some, at some time for who would find the most intuitive proof of this result. There are many nice properties that this Kemeny's constant satisfies. In particular, you can neatly express it as a sum over the non-zero eigenvalues of the transition matrix. Okay, so it has a very nice spectral expression shown here. But still, uh, you know, this is a very nice expression. You just need to know the eigenvalues. But knowing the eigenvalues, on the other hand, still requires you to diagonalize a large n by n matrix, which is computationally a daunting task. But fortunately, there's a very nice approximation that is offered to us, which is to use this, to capitalize on this fact mentioned earlier that downward transitions are very different, have a very different rate than the corresponding upward transitions. That is to say that the upward rate is exponentially suppressed compared to the downward rate. So at early times, it actually makes sense. It is justified to neglect these down, these upward uh, transitions and to treat only the downward transitions as the allowed ones. If you make this choice and you label your vacua in increasing order of potential energy, you can convince yourself that the transition matrix will become upper triangular. So the lower triangular part of this matrix corresponds to all the upward transitions which are being neglected and therefore set to zero. And the upper triangular part are all the downward transitions that we care about. Furthermore, the diagonal entries are just the total decay rate of each of the nodes in the network, each of the vacua, you see? Uh, and by the way, in this downward approximation, of course, the lowest lying vacuum will be absolutely stable in this approximation, and therefore kappa one here is zero. But as we all know, of course, the eigenvalues of a upper triangular matrix are just given by the diagonal entries. So that does the diagonalization trivially that the, all the eigenvalues are just given by the decay rates of each of the vacua. So that is a particularly, particularly useful expression for, for this mean first passage time for Kemeny's constant, simply given by the average lifetime of all the vacua 
all the metastable vacua in the region. So it's in fact a mean residency time. How much time on average do you spend in each vacuum? Uh, and remarkably, in fact, there is almost an analog, an identical expression than what that one finds in the problem of diffusion in disordered media. It's exactly of this form. Now, um, this is the result. And now I want to come back to an ensemble of regions. A typical region in this ensemble will be highly rugged as sketched here. There will be many, in general, many vacua whose only allowed transitions involve an upward jump. That is to say that these vacua to leading order in the downward approximation would be stable, absolutely stable. But of course, beyond the downward approximation, it means that they would be exponentially long lived. So in these rugged regions, the corresponding uh, first passage time, mean first passage time, will be an exponential in the number of vacua in the region. And this is con consistent with the NP hard complexity class of the general problem, okay? In terms of our, the, our, our foragers, these, are, these correspond to highly inefficient foraging strategies. However, in the vastness of this ensemble, there will be exceptional golden regions that will look like this. In these regions, every vacuum has at least one allowed downward transitions. And therefore, I think of it as a valley or a funnel. And it looks like this, where a hospitable vacuum would lie at the bottom of this throat. And in this case, the foraging strategy is highly efficient. The corresponding first passage time, instead of scaling exponentially, scales can scale as a power law. This, in fact, is nature's solution to the folding problem of proteins. <laughs> I forgot to turn off the volume. Anyways, the protein folding problem, let me fix this because it's a little bit silly. Ay, ay, ay. This is hilarious. Is that normally I don't have my. Uh, it's, com it's completely okay with the sound. I, I don't have my. Yeah. No problem. <laughs> no, but just give me a sec. I'll fix this. It's totally hilarious. Otherwise. Yeah. Okay. Movie. All right. Perfect. Okay. All right. Let me move you. Do I move you to the right? Okay, it doesn't matter. Yeah, so the, um, yeah, I was saying, as I was saying, uh, this is nature's solution to the uh, protein. Truly occurring proteins fold on a short time scale is precisely because their energy landscape looks like a funnel in the vicinity of the folded or native state. This in biology is known as the principle of minimal frustration. So that's the key idea that a vacuum like ours resides in a funnel. In fact, indeed, you can think of this at some level as an example of natural selection. This is just for fun as an analogy, but you can think of this landscape as a gene pool, right? All these little variations in each region uh, correspond to a different set of alleles, the gen genetic makeup of different vacua is heritable as universe expands, produces more and more regions of volume, physical volume, and the genetic makeup is being conserved, preserved. And most importantly, the hospitable alleles, they compete. If you look at all these, these hospitable vacua, they're competing for a resource, which is space-time volume. And so one could say that the hospitable vacua are like alleles that are best adapted to their environment in the sense that they get selected or accessed early on. Okay, this is pretty much what I've said. 
Uh, let me, sorry, let me move you a little bit to the side because now I don't see what I'm writing. Okay, all right. All right, so just to recap, uh, this is what we have so far, that if we just care about minimizing this first passage time, then it constrains the topography or topology of the network. But otherwise, it favors the fastest rates possible. Okay, the faster the rates, the shorter is this MFPT. Let me pause here perhaps to see if there are any questions. Yeah, like you move. Okay. Just one thing I want to ask. Maybe again, <laughs> yes. I'm asking too many questions actually. So, is there any connection? No, no, this is fine. Yeah. Uh, so, is there any connection with uh, like um, some basic understandings of graph theory and uh, uh, like uh, because I, I feel like the, the like the structure of the landscape in terms of nodes that you have explained, the, there are some connection with uh, the graph theory. Is it so? Like, oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, that's that's in fact uh, the, the main point I would like to stress that um, once you understand, of course, the landscape as a network, and uh, and of course, we're not the first ones to think about it this way, but indeed, now you can start thinking about optimality, optimizing these networks uh, for different observables as we're doing here for the first passage time. Uh, and, uh, you know, in the last, how should I say? Well, I, I'll, maybe I'll come back a little bit to that later, but let me just answer now since you're asking a very nice question, which is that, um, you know, historically when people think of networks, there were sort of two extremes to networks. One of them uh, are networks that are completely regular like lattices, okay? Um, and at the other extreme are completely random networks like Erdos Reni is a classic example. And what people have understood in the last 20, 30 years is that in fact, real life networks, networks that occur in nature or in social interactions, the internet, all kinds of what people call real world networks are sort of in between. They're neither structured nor random. Um, and, uh, and these are known as complex uh, networks in general. Uh, and uh, I could go on about this. Um, in fact, with regards to protein, protein, proteins have a network from a point of view of network theory, uh, which is very much like the, like the web, like the internet, okay? Um, and so one can indeed, uh, this is what we're doing now, you can try to, study various cosmological observables, uh, assuming that we are in a region of the landscape, which is a sort of real world network of the sort of the web or protein folding network. Um, why not? I think it's a, it's, a, it's a worthwhile thing to pursue. And so, yeah, your question is very prescient indeed what we know about networks, what we've learned in the last 20 years, how does that, what bearings does it have on our understanding of the multiverse? Yeah, it's, it's really interesting actually. The, I feel that yeah, there should be some very deeper connection and like a lot of things there. So. Yeah, for example, one thing that people have understood is that um, let me tell you one property, for example, that uh, that you're that you know about. So, uh, in the web, as well as with proteins, the degree distribution. So, how many nodes are you connected to on average? Follows a power law. It's a scale invariant uh, mm -hmm. distribution. So, there are nodes because it has a fat tail. This distribution it means that there are nodes which are highly, highly connected. They're like hubs in the network. Mm -hmm. So, in the World Wide Web, this would be like Google. The Google website is connected to so many, which means that on average, uh, it takes actually very few steps to traverse the entire, uh, the entire World Wide Web. Okay, to go from one, in some sense, 
from one end to the other takes a very few steps. It's logarithmic in the total number of websites. Hmm. Um, so these properties of being scale-free, what people call the small world network, um, these are all features of complex networks, which are not at all what you know would come out of a box uh, in random in random graphs. So uh, yeah, so these are these are really interesting questions that I'm currently thinking about. Really, thanks for pointing these out because yeah, it it makes me think about a lot of new a new particularly new direction so yeah maybe i will look into your work to know about all these things thank you thank you thank you very much okay let me uh, perhaps continue a little bit uh, so so far we were idealizing the region as a closed system but, but of course in reality the region we're thinking about is open okay uh, this is our region our fiducial region but really it is part of a much larger landscape so we would like to ask the question in this more general and realistic framework, right? How can we maximize, let's say that a random walker hits upon this golden region, this funnel region, how can we maximize the probability that the watcher will find hospitable vacua before escaping the region, okay? There will always be some probability to escape. This is what I, wanted, this is what, what I would like to discuss next. Um, and what I'm going to study is uh, a proxy requirement. So instead of thinking of modeling this environment, I'm going to still think of the region by itself. But we will think about the hypothetical limit where the number of nodes in this region grows to infinity. And I'm going to demand that random walks in this region are recurrent in this limit. And I'm going to define for you what recurrence means. But what it really means essentially it's a proxy for exploration being sweeping that is to say to be able to really explore all the sites in this region even in the limit where the number of sites becomes infinitely large okay so let me tell you perhaps about this return yes please since you have a yes please in this case we are uh, you are considering open system so like, yes. I'm just trying to connect with the usual notion of uh, open systems, which we, I don't know whether that thing and this thing is same. So we usually think of like whatever system we have, there should be some, uh, there should be some kind of environment outside and the system is interacting with the environment. And uh, there are two possibilities. Some people used to consider there might be some memory effect uh, means Markovian, some people used to consider non-Markovian. So once you consider the dynamics that will reflect in the dynamics in terms of lean bloodian and all, those things will appear here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. That's a brilliant question also. Um, I'm gonna get to that picture a little bit later, uh, but it, this is indeed a, a perfectly good way to think about it. I'm gonna think of the environment as uh, so indeed, one can approximate it as being Markovian process um, in which the environment is giving in some uh, influx of volume rather slowly because the environment will be slow, which is sort of the opposite limit of normally what we think of as an environment that would give rise to Markovian dynamics. But it does so slowly. And meanwhile, it can also receive volume that is escaping from the region. I'm gonna dis describe that a little bit later, but uh, indeed, uh, and there's an analogy, uh, a sort of very simple analogy with this, which is that of a sand pile, um, which, okay. So maybe I put that a little bit on the back burner, but indeed all the question you're raising are, are the correct ones to ask. Thank you. Let me entertain for the moment this idea of recurrence and transience because it's fun to think about. So let us think about a random walk on a network, okay, or on a lattice if you prefer. A, the property of the random walk being recurrent is the statement that if you start from one node that you are guaranteed to return to this node some finite time later. And therefore, because the, no, because the process 
recurrence is Markovian, you will do so an infinite number of times in the future. So recurrences, you always end up coming back to your starting point. In contrast, a transient walk is one in which the random walker has a finite probability never to return to its starting node, okay? It may do so a few times, but there's a finite probability that the walker will eventually wander off never to return. In random walks on lattices, uh, for example, right, let, let me once again focus, <laughs> let me once again fix my sound. Sorry about this. This is totally hilarious. Um, this is a problem. What is going on with this thing? One second. Okay, this one. Okay. This is a problem that was considered by uh, George Polia, uh, who showed famously that simple random walks in Euclidean d-dimensional space, they're recurrent for dimension less than or equal to two and transient for d greater than two. And you can see it here pictorially that you see the random walk in two dimensions is dense, tends to come back to itself. Whereas in higher dimension, it's purely a co-dimensional effect, a co-dimension effect that in higher dimension, there's just a greater probability for the, for the, uh, the world line of this walker never to come back. In fact, though, it's amusing that George Polia thought about uh, this problem by, because every night he was taking a walk in a park in Paris and kept running into the same couple. Uh, and he wondered, uh, what, would, what was the probability that in this two-dimensional random walk, he kept finding the same people intersecting, intersecting random walks. And that's what led him to consider this problem. In any event, history aside, um, this also led mathematician Kakutani to quip that this means that a drunken man will find his way home, whereas a drunken bird may be lost forever. Let me make this a little bit uh, more precise. In first passage statistics, the most important quantity is the first passage density that I'm calling here F, which is the first passage density to uh, starting from node I to visit node K for the first time at time T. So all the first passage statistics can be computed from this quantity. For example, the mean first passage time is just the first moment of this of this probability distribution function. And one can define therefore an escape probability simply as one minus the ever return probability computed as an integral of FII, okay? So this defines the escape probability from node I in this way. And one says that if this escape probability is zero, then the walk is recurrent. That is to say, you never escape. You always come back with probability one. Whereas if this escape probability is finite, then this corresponds to transients. And you notice that what I've done here is I've written the escape probability in terms of what I call R sub i inverse, okay? So being recurrent corresponds to a divergent R, whereas transients corresponds to finite R. And the reason for doing so is that remarkably, this uh, recurrence parameter, figure of merit, uh, matches precisely this average MFPT that we've computed earlier, precisely, okay. So in other words, um, there are two requirements, so to speak, that we've considered thus far. One is that the search process be efficient, which corresponds to minimizing this first passage time, which was written as a mean residency time, an average lifetime of all the vacua. And the second requirement is that at the same time, we want our search to be sweeping. That is to say, we wanna make sure that we visit most of the sites in the region without escaping. And the proxy for the sweeping exploration is that our random walk be recurrent which is to say that this quantity, the same quantity that we're trying to minimize, when we take n to infinity, it should diverge. So these two requirements together are sort of talking opposite one another. 
And therefore, it requires you that this uh, mean first passage time diverges with n, but should diverge very slowly, as slow as possible, for instance, logarithmically. This logarithmic behavior as a function of the number of vacua is reminiscent of, is reminiscent of dynamical criticality. It's a critical boundary, if you want, between this recurring behavior and this transient behavior. So optimal search processes correspond to being at this critical boundary. Okay, I'm not gonna go through all these details here, but I will say that uh, what you can show is that to be at this critical boundary corresponds to the lifetime of vacua being of the order of the page time shown here. So the critical case, where the, the mean first passage time scales logarithmically with n corresponds to a lifetime which scales as one over the Hubble parameter cube of each vacuum. And this is recognized as the De Sitter page time, which is quite remarkable. So that is the statement. And in fact, there is a very, very similar uh, phase transition, dynamical phase transition that is found in diffusion in disordered media, a, a transition between normal diffusion and anomalous uh, diffusion. So this is a very similar uh, form of criticality here. Okay, so given this observation, I wanna so, step back a little bit that, and- still, Yes, please, Ayanta. Uh, yes. Uh, there in this uh, uh, phase transition, what is the order parameter? like? this alpha to be the order parameter for this transition? Yeah, very good. So uh, yeah, that's an excellent question. So here per se, I, I, I'm not sure there is an order parameter uh, in the sense that this is really non-equilibrium um, phenomenon. Um, so the the parameter perhaps may be maybe the scaling of this uh, of this uh, of this search time. Oh. Yeah, that is the that is the the measure of the transition, so to speak. Okay. The uh, yes, yeah, so in fact, to this point, let me um, let me highlight the distinction between equilibrium versus non-equilibrium uh, phase transition. So we're all familiar with equilibrium criticality, as we were just discussing now with uh, Sayantan. Uh, a system of spins, for example, as you tune the temperature to critical temperature, you reach this phase where the correlation length diverges and you have clusters of spins that are scale invariant of all scales. In contrast, uh, a class of non-equilibrium phase, trans phase transitions that have been studied in recent years corresponds to open systems that are slowly driven such as the sand pile. This is a somewhat controversial topic, so I don't wanna get into all the details, but let's say an idealized sand pile is one in which you drop grains of sands adiabatically, okay, very slowly. And over time, it triggers a sequence of avalanches. And you can ask about the frequency of avalanches as a function of size. That is to say, how many, in avalanche, how many grains are being are being toppled, uh, and what find one finds that the distribution of these avalanches satisfies a power law. The frequency of them, the power spectrum, is a one over f or pink noise uh, power spectrum. Now let me, in fact, talk to the statement about dynamical criticality more generally. Um, it's been argued that this critical boundary between stable dynamics and unstable dynamics, um, what people call in computation, they call it the edge of chaos, maximizes a number of computational capabilities. The simplest example are cellular automata. So in the 1980s, Stephen Wolfram studied various nearest neighbor cellular automata rules. I've shown three here. So, Dustin? Yes. Yeah. 
this stability and stability uh, uh, like in uh, like in classical mechanics we used to identify with uh, something called lyapunov exponent i was going to say that so that in this case you could think of as an order parameter the, yeah. the lyapunov exponent ranging from negative values to positive values yeah thank you yeah, indeed, that's exactly uh, what I was going to say. So, uh, of course, here it's a finite system, so one has to be somewhat careful with defining a Lyapunov exponent, but still one can approximately do so. And what Wolfram found is that the behavior of the cellular automata could be classified into different qualitative behavior. On the left, you see a cellular automata that sort of dies off or, you know, uh, so here time goes downwards uh, in this plot. You started from some initial data and then rapidly the automata becomes either, either it dies or it follows some regular oscillatory behavior. On the right hand plot, uh, instead you find some chaotic behavior. That is, that is to say after the initial step rapidly the behavior becomes quite random. But the middle plot, which is sort of a critical behavior, uh, instead of somewhat, somewhat lies in between, you find these transient structures which are arbitrarily long lived, okay? And the behavior is neither completely random nor periodic, okay? And uh, Langdon and others argued subsequently that at this phase transition between ordered and disordered dynamics, the automaton uh, can perform universal computation, okay? It sort of maximizes the computational capabilities at this phase transition. In fact, the more sophisticated version of this in the modern world are neural networks. In particular, there's a class of neural networks, recurrent neural networks, which have been shown to maximize their computational capabilities precisely as Sayantan was saying, precisely when the Lyapunov exponent um, uh, is around zero, okay? In fact, you can see here from the plot that it peaks slightly on the stable side, okay? Which is an interesting point in and of itself, but nearby zero, okay? And furthermore, in the, in the natural world, um, dynamical criticality is also favored. It's believed that it's the optimal compromise between a system being robust to changes of the environment uh, and being adaptable, okay? So you, you neither wanna to be too stiff, you wanna be flexible. And at the same time, you wanna be able to have reproducible, reproduced behavior, okay? So it's again, a compromise. And one example of this I'm showing here is, is the brain. So here's the brain of a zebrafish, uh, a larva zebrafish, which is being kept at fixed position, okay, uh, being paralyzed, and it's being stimulated by optical light. And you see here the flashes are neurons that are being lit up, uh, which corresponds to the fish starting to swim, being stimulated by the light. And uh, these avalanches of neurons, you can see, satisfies this power law. So here there's a very simple understanding of why the brain should be tuned at this critical point. And it's the fact that if you imagine these neuronal avalanches, when you have a signal that starts somewhere in your brain, if the brain were very much stable dynamically, then this avalanche would quickly die off, no? Just a few other neurons would light up. At the other extreme, if you're in the, a chaotic regime, then one neuron going off would trigger the entire brain lighting up in some sense, which also would be undesirable. So somehow this uh, edge of chaos that we live in uh, is, somehow, is somehow the optimal compromise. You have these arbitrarily large avalanches, but still it's not completely chaotic either. The heart is also like this. I could go on and on. Music has been shown to be uh, most pleasing to the ear where it has this one over F behavior. Uh, there are many ways in which this is uh, something that is optimal. My favorite example of all uh, is the, flock behavior, the flocking behavior of birds shown here, the starlings. So these birds are like a spin system to a good approximation. Each bird only interacts, so to speak, 
with a few other birds nearby in the flock of order seven. But the flock shown here is of order hundreds, maybe a thousand birds. And if you subtract out the bulk motion of the flock, okay, so the sort of mean velocity, and you're just left with the velocity fluctuations, you can show that the velocity fluctuations have correlation function, which is power law, which scales like the size of the flock. The evolutionary advantage of the flock being in this way, in this configuration, is that, of course, if there's a predator that hits the flock, you know, somewhere in the, uh, so at some end of the flock, that rapidly the flock is susceptible, the signal propagates across the entire si system very efficiently, okay? So this is, uh, this is something that is seen in nature uh, everywhere. Yeah, Justin, I have a question. Uh, yes, please. From, from this trajectory of these birds, uh, is it kind of, uh, maybe like I am not sure, that's why I'm asking, uh, is it kind of uh, uh, some sort of fractal that we uh, used to study in classical dynamical systems? Uh, I would think more of it, uh, yeah, so I, maybe um, the, maybe the best analogy might be the system of spins in the sense that if you take out the mean uh, motion and you just look at the, the velocity, each bird has a, has, a, has a three velocity vector. Yes. And you look at the two point correlation function of these fluctuations, their correlation length is the size of the flock. Okay, okay. so it really is. Now, one thing I should, I should uh, warn us again is that if you think of it as spin, there's a danger to think of this as spontaneous symmetry breaking, which wouldn't be criticality, of course. That is to say, these, these spins, these velocities are spontaneously breaking rotational invariance. Yes. But people who study birds, actually, yes. um, they've shown that it's not just the orientation of the, of the spins, which would be like the goldstone, which are scale invariant, but also the speed correlation is scale invariant, telling you that, and this is like the massive mode, if you want, for this, uh, in this case, that is also scale invariant. So that is uh, very much... Um, criticality. Uh, relatedly, I can also make a point about the, the brain. One may wonder, and that's been discussed, that, you know, brain neurons are showing this power law, but of course, power law is the consequence of criticality, but it's not sufficient, right? Meaning, criticality implies power laws, but power laws don't imply criticality. And, but what people have done in this case is that you can chemically bias brain. So they're taking, they, they took the brain of a rat and you slice it, okay, in many uh, sort of two-dimensional systems. And you can chemically bias some of these two-dimensional slices. And you can see that as you chemically change uh, these, uh, these slices, that criticality disappears. Okay, so you can really see that it is really a tuning process, a self-tuning process of the network. I don't know if that, does that roughly answer your question? Yes, yes. Thank you. Okay, now actually I wanna come back to something you mentioned earlier, which is sort of another way to think about an open system. And that's a paper that uh, we published about a year ago with my students. Um, which is, as you said, I can think of this open system in terms of a driven uh, Markov equation shown here. So, so here I'm thinking of it as volume of the of different vacua in the region. That's what I'm calling V. The transition matrix includes, in this case, a decay, a leakage into the environment because vacua can decay into vacua that are outside the region. That's encoded in the transition matrix. And there's also a inhomogeneous term, a source term, which is volume flux that is coming from the environment. Okay, that's very much along the line of what you were thinking about, Sayan Tanner, over here. Um, 
And so the first thing to say is that, well, this is a, a driven system and we can think about the susceptibility of this system, how the volume is affected by this influx through a susceptibility tensor, just shown here, uh, which involves, of course, the Green's function. It involves the inverse of this transition matrix. If you compute the average susceptibility and specifically in the static limit, which is what we care about since the environment is to be thought of as very slow compared to the, to the response of the system, then the static susceptibility, in fact, is just the a trace of the inverse of the matrix M. In other words, it's precisely this MFPT that we considered earlier. So the, in other words, at criticality, this is another way to think about it. We wanted to minimize T to have quick efficiency, but also we, you know, this recurrence criterion that T diverges as a function of N slowly. Here we see another guise of this, that it makes the region most susceptible uh, to volume influx from the environment. Okay. And now to make even more concrete analogy with the sand pile, I can consider volume fluctuations. So look, looking at the fluctuations of the system now about this, uh, about the, the sort of stationary uh, state um, with a noise term coming from fluctuations in the volume intake from the environment, the volume flux. And we model this, uh, let's model this noise by, by white noise for simplicity. Then what we have here, you can show can be mapped to a set of driven overdamped oscillators in this way. And what's remarkable, uh, I won't go through all the math, but you can compute the, cor the, the correlation function in time for these oscillators. You can compute the corresponding power spectrum. And what you, slump. And what you find- in slow motion at quarter speed. Let me again deal with my movie. It's actually kind of hilarious. Um, what you find ultimately is that the uh, behavior of the power spectrum at criticality has this uh, specific shape of one over F or one over frequency, precisely as the sand pile. So this is again, another uh, sign, another diagnostic of dynamical criticality that these volume avalanches, so to speak, are, are have a one over F or big oh, noise power spectrum. Justin, mm -hmm. I want to ask one more yes. question. Because I have yes. one more similarity with another old problem studied by Feynman, Vernon, Caldera, Leggett, a lot of people uh, in the context of quantum dissipation. So is there is any similarity yes. with that? Uh, so I'm not sure is the honest answer. Uh, I know the model you're referring to, the toy model for decoherence. Yes. Uh, the closest problem here that I found is the, um, what is it called? The uh, Uhlenbeck problem, oh, Hornstein-Uhlenbeck. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Hornstein-Uhlenbeck uh, oscillators. Oh. Uh, this problem can be mapped identically to that problem, it turns out, of the Ornstein Uhlenbeck. Um, and, uh, and the origin of one over F is simply that you have all these oscillators with different uh, independent frequencies and they're coupled together. And, uh, and it so happens that at criticality or what we call criticality here, that the spectrum the eigenvalue spectrum of these different oscillators is such that it gives rise to this, um, this one over F noise. Um, I should say that people have, it's, it's one of the longest existing explanation for one over F in nature, that you just take a bunch of oscillators or yeah, a bunch of uh, over damped uh, entities that have some spectrum of frequencies each of them, uh, and it gives rise overall to one over F spectrum. And in the literature, this was never thought of as completely satisfactory because you always had to explain why it is that uh, you would have this particular 
spectrum of, of, uh, of oscillator frequency. And here there's sort of an understanding or a mechanism by which we, uh, we favor this, this particular spectrum. Yeah, yeah. That, that's the closest analog, this einstein uhlenbeck uh, oscillator system. Yeah, and one more thing. So the uh, uh, yes. conclusion re regarding the criticality that you have obtained, that is basically based on the assumption that it is a white noise. For a colored noise, how that will going to change? Is it very model dependent? Ah, very good. So. If it's colored, it would change the, the answer. That is right. Um, we also showed it doesn't have to be Gaussian, however, but it should be, it should be white, yes, that's right. And uh, my understanding, yeah, this is something that has to be justified in, in a realistic landscape. Okay. Okay? Yeah. Yeah, these are all great questions, thank you. Okay, um, ah, this goes a little bit, uh, I'm almost done, by the way, I don't know how long I've been going. Um, but uh, this is another, um, this is something that we've been doing more recently uh, with an excellent postdoc at Penn Sam Wong, which is to study the idea of percolation in the landscape, which is to say that, you know, in the landscape, if you think about it, uh, there's a time scale involved for each of these transitions. And so as a function of time, more and more transitions sort of become available uh, to the dynamics. And uh, so this goes back to something you asked earlier, I think Sayantan about graph theory. So one classic way to model a network uh, is as a random graph. The classic example is Erdos and Renyi, who proposed that you have you take a set of nodes and you assign a probability p to a link linking any pair of nodes on this network. Okay, and here's a here's a sort of sketch of what happened. There's a phase transition basically. Uh, if p is less than some critical probability p c, that's the left hand plot. What you have are small disconnected clusters in the graph. Um, on the other hand, for P larger than PC, that's on the right-hand side, you basically get components that are of the size or some fraction and to some power, uh, a giant component uh, of connected nodes. And the critical P is one in which this giant component emerges. So we studied essentially uh, in our case, you could ascribe a probability P to be the probability that two vacua are connected by a CDL instanton. And uh, well, anyways, I'll go a little bit quickly over this, but what we've shown is that if you think about the probability to go from one vacuum to another, what we call the hitting probability here, it grows shown by the blue curve it basically is zero for distant vacua below this critical PC, but it grows to be order one uh, as a phase transition at PC. On the other hand, as we've discussed, we also want to have lifetimes or this recurrence uh, time to be divergent. We want lifetime of vacua to be, to be long enough. That's the orange curve. And you see that it has the opposite behavior so that the product of the two, which may be an ideal measure for our process, shows a peak at the percolation phase transition. So this is something I don't have, unfortunately, much time to, to dwell on. But uh, suffice to say that um, there's some measure here, again, of, of accessibility of different vacua, which peaks uh, at percolation, we think. Okay, let me uh, conclude with some phenomenological implications, implications for particle physics. So let's go back to the metastability of our vacuum. Um, as we've said, uh, there's a sort of critical lifetime uh, which selects the page time as being favored. And for the vacuum such as ours, given our cosmological constant, 
This corresponds to a time scale of 10 to the 130 years, approximately. It is striking to me that uh, this is not far, well, relatively speaking, from the central value of the standard model, which as we've said was 10 to the 500 with some relatively large error bars. Uh, this agrees remarkably to within two sigma uh, with our predicted ideal lifetime. Uh, but as I'm about to say, or to mention, this is sensitive to uh, assumptions about UV physics. By the way, this is something that Thomas Steingasser, who's here and I have been studying for the last year, over the last year, uh, about the standard model extensions and what it entails for the hierarchy problem um, of having a lifetime of the order of the page time. Anyways, from our point of view, uh, having these sort of efficient lifetimes gives an explanation for the observed inferred uh, Higgs metastability. One could also ask why we have an observed low scale supersymmetry. And here's a possible explanation. Suppose we did discover low scale supersymmetry at the LHC. What, we would, what would we conclude? Well, either on the one hand, this discovery would, this would have a dramatic impact, of course, on the metastability calculation. And what would we conclude? Well. If given the particles we discover, we infer that in fact, the standard model is therefore unstable. This would mean that the spectrum of particles at that point is still incomplete. There must be for consistency, new particles to be discovered. If on the other hand, uh, at the other extreme, it makes the standard model stable, this would be in, in, in this context, disfavored by our mechanism. The third possibility is that it keeps the standard model within the metastable sliver. But in my opinion, you see already within the standard model, this requires a delicate cancellation, a delicate tuning conspiracy among different parameters, exquisitely sensitive. So given that the standard model is already fine tuned this way, I find it highly unlikely that new physics would maintain this conspiracy. I may be wrong, but that's my bias. So I'm led to conclude that therefore the only reasonable and expected outcome is that new physics at the LHC would render the standard model stable. And if that's the case, it would rule out our mechanism or flipped the other way, our mechanism favors that there's nothing there, at least until very high energy scale, much beyond the reach of the LHC. Right-handed neutrinos, for instance, is something else that Thomas and I have been studying and exploring. Uh, like the top quark, it tends to make the vacuum more unstable. And uh, indeed, if the mass of these right-handed neutrinos uh, is around 10 to the 13, 10 to the 14 GeV, uh, what Thomas and I have shown is that this brings the lifetime closer to the favored page time. So in other words, the page time or this idealized lifetime offers guidance for uh, what we deem to be uh, reasonable, so to speak, uh, extensions of the standard model. Axions is another example. Uh, you can show that to preserve metastability, so axions assuming uh, a weakly coupled uh, QCD axion with a, that is to say with some U1 a complex scalar field theory, you can show that uh, this tends to stabilize the Higgs. And so in order to keep the lifetime to be significant, it puts a lower bound on the axion decay constant. There's another ongoing project that I have with, uh, with my colleagues uh, who are F theorists uh, uh, at Northeastern, uh, Jim Alberson, who's a professor there, and Cody Long, who's postdoc at Harvard. So they've developed, in the context of F theory, a sort of landscape of F theory geometries shown here as a network. Okay, so here this is a little bit of a different kind of network than what we've studied earlier. These links between nodes are links between their geometrical transitions 
uh, blow-ups that they call between different F-theory geometries. So here, each node is not a single vacuum. It's a geometry that can harbor a large number of flux vacua. So each node here corresponds to many vacua. But what's nice about these, this uh, tree construction that they've developed is that for each of these geometry, they have a handle from geometric data on the gauge group that lives there, as well as the number of light degrees of freedom, such as a number of axions. So in other words, they have a, a knowledge of the particle physics complexity on this network, okay? This is obviously beyond uh, what I understand, but that is their construction and it's, it's quite robust. So what we can do is by ascribing transition rates between these geometries in a suitable way, we can hope to make predictions for what different measures predict. Do we tend to predict that we live in geometries that have a larger gauge gauge group and more axions or rather simple gauge groups and fewer like degrees of freedom. So this is just a preliminary result, but on the left-hand plot, you see this is the prediction in the context of the Vilenkin late time equilibrium measure. I don't know if you can see, but there are, uh, so the, the color scale here is that red is favored, blue is disfavored. So you can see a few red dots that live near the edges of the left-hand plot. Okay, so the equilibrium late time measure tends to favor the peripheral nodes in their network, which corresponds to large gauge groups and large number of axions. So the late time equilibrium measure favors rather rich complex particle physics. In contrast, an early time or accessibility measure of the kind that I've been discussing today uh, favors nodes that are more central in the diagram as you show as you see on the right and these corresponds to geometries that have smaller gauge groups and smaller number of axions this is very preliminary but this is just to say that uh, this illustrates a little bit my vision for what might come out of these studies i would like i would hope that one could show that vacua that are populated early on, in fact, correspond to simpler uh, particle physics and maybe tied perhaps to the minimality, ultimately tied to the minimality of our own universe. Okay, just to conclude, um, here are my final thoughts. Uh, I think it's pretty striking that most fine tuning problems that we think about can be cast as problems of criticality. Uh, and I've tried to argue that possible origin for the near criticality of our universe uh, comes from some non-equilibrium critical phenomena on the landscape. In fact, I would argue that if there is criticality on the landscape, it can really only be of a non-equilibrium nature, uh, aside, of course, from quantum phase transitions. But it can't, I, I think it cannot be a sort of equilibrium uh, phase transitions that we're normally accustomed to. It must have to do with dynamics. Uh, that is my, my belief. Uh, indeed, uh, this ties into different notions or, or assumptions of typicality for, you know, for understanding our place in the multiverse. Um, the usual approach that uh, Vilenkin and collaborators have developed is one in which we are typical of any vacua at very late times in a multiverse. And this is the principle of mediocrity in a nutshell. Um, whereas in biology, there's a very different notion of typicality. I would like to argue that in fact, that the outcome of natural selection are tend to be very fine tuned apparently, and also nearly critical. Analogously, what I've argued is that search optimization, finding vacua early on in the multiverse uh, offers a selection mechanism and it favors regions of the landscape that have a funnel topography and lifetimes that are pretty healthy, pretty quick, um, typically favored to be or of the order of the page time. And this is analogous to the situation with protein folding. And I think this is just a very fruitful and fun field to think about, uh, given that it ties together concepts in cosmology, uh, biology, 
and network science and graph theory. Okay, that's all I had to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Justin, for giving such an outstanding talk. And uh, it's like I'm very much interested so, on so many things that you have talked. So before uh, going to next, like I would, I would uh, suggest all the all the attendees, please unmute yourself and give a clap for Justin for giving such a nice talk. Please do that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So if anybody have any question, please ask. Otherwise, I can understand he's very tired because it is very long talk. And this talk will be posted in YouTube. Once this is posted, I will share the link with you. You can share with your students, everyone. And uh, yeah, if there is any question, please ask now. Any question or any comments? Yeah, mostly uh, all of you, uh, there are few students of yours, they don't have any question because they already have worked on you. Worked no, 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 they're not students, not at all. Well, Thomas is a student, but uh, I consider him to be postdoc really. Uh, and Elisa is, uh, is a senior staff or very senior anyways. <laughs> so no, no, but anyways, yes, <laughs> they, are, they, are, they are indeed experts, but uh, yes. Yeah, okay, so, uh, I will stop recording right now because I have to talk to you. So I would suggest all the other attendees, please, uh, if you go out because I have to talk to Justin.